You're listening to Building the Broncos with Nick Kendall and Carl Dummler, Broncos country's leading draft and scouting analysts. Get on over to milehighhuddle.com to sound off on all things Broncos. All right, welcome in everyone to Building the Broncos. I am your host, Carl Dummler, and of course, Mr. Nick Kendall is joining me. And uh, I see you're wearing a, a Marvel shirt there. Nice, Mr. Captain America. And you even Absolutely. got the hair going with it. I mean, everything. <laughs> Not the teeth. Uh, I, I, Michael, Michael Strahan and I had the, the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got the uh, the Warrior Dash shirt going today. Okay. So got got some race training that I'm doing right now. Um, got my race canceled in in, uh, in June here, unfortunately. But yeah. there there might be one in Denver in August. So we'll, we'll see if that happens or not. But uh, anyway, I'm excited to talk some football here with you once again for another week. And uh, today we're going to be kind of digging into the roles of the the rookies and kind of what we see them having as, as especially just their rookie season. What can they bring to the table? What are some realistic expectations for everyone? And so we're, we're going to get into that. But uh, I want to make sure everybody knows. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. You can find me at Carl Dumbler MHH and Nick at Nick Kindle MHH. And of course, the the tw- podcast Twitter account at BTB Football Pod. Make sure you're subscribing to our show wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating. Also, don't miss out on all of our great, great off season content at MileHighHuddle.com of the Maven Coalition and Sports Illustrated. And also know that this podcast is powered by Overtime Media. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right. Well, we are uh, – I'm, I'm just – I love every week that we get to do this, man. It, it always goes, I know. It, it always goes so fast. So, everybody, welcome in. Appreciate you all joining us here today. And, uh, yeah, let, let's let's dig into this. Let's start uh, – just want to go the first round, kind of talk through each round. Is that how you want to do this? Yeah, I think that's the best way to go. Okay. Well, so first we got to say, obviously, hi, Buana Beast in here. Miller, hi, Rob. Clayton Heron, love the show. Thank you. Uh, Karen Haynes, Bronx legend, of course. Terry Randall, Steve Baumgartner, uh, Dylan Van Arks. I mean, we got the uh, we got some MVPs in here today. So really excited to get still, still talking some Denver Broncos draft. It's the best time of year still. Right. And uh, just to, to give a little hint, maybe halfway through the show, we might have a little bit of a giveaway. So you're, you're going to want to pay attention. Uh, so uh, we're, we're going to have a little contest, see if somebody can guess something. Um, I'm excited about that. But uh, anyway, all right, let's get into the the draft here. We got Jerry Judy in the first round. Yeah. And well, well, before uh, again, we even get there, let's talk about what we're going to do today. Okay. Obviously. So yeah, today, ahead. Carl and I talked about, you know, we still have obviously all these morsels in regards to the Denver Broncos draft. And now that we have all the speculation over in regards to who the Broncos are going to be adding, now comes an equally fun part, in my opinion, is wondering how all these puzzle pieces just fit together perfectly. So we're going to go through the draft order today, the Broncos draft hall, maybe even some of the undrafted free agent guys as well, and just talk talk about the guys they're going to be in competition with this upcoming season for roster spot, where these rookies are going to fit on the roster, and just the overall roles we would project them in this season. So obviously excited to talk about that. Number one, 15th pick overall, uh, Buona Beast, Nick's mom's cookie giveaway. Uh, you guys, oh, go, we're clicking the same one there, Carl. Uh, I'll let you handle that. You're better at that okay. than I am. I, I shake the computer a little bit. I'm a little bit of a, a pounder in that regard. Uh, but Juwan, or excuse me, Jerry Judy, 15 overall, Denver Broncos wide receiver. I guess the, the big question here, Carl, who is the Broncos' number one wide receiver, Jerry Judy or Cortland Sutton? Can the answer be both? You have... Trick question. You guarantee you passed. I'm yes. so happy with you. Yes. Guess what, guys? Just like the Broncos had three really good cornerbacks in 2015 with the likes of Aqib Tlaib, Chris Harris Jr., Bradley Roby, just like they have Bradley Chubb and Von Miller now, you can have more than one good player at a position that sees the field more than one at a time. You can have three wide receivers on the field at the same time. In fact, that's a majority. So if you have two number one wide receivers, well done. You're ahead of the game. So Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, for me, obviously. So I'll kick it off to you. You're more of the wide receiver guy than I am, even though I've been pounding the table for wide receiver this whole season. What is Jerry Judy's role this upcoming season? Who's he in competition with for snaps? Well, nobody, honestly. I mean, he's the number two guy the day he walks in the building. Unfortunately, the Broncos were just so down on talent at the wide receiver position. It was Cortland Sutton clear up here at the top, and then a bunch of guys that honestly – 
I don't want to be too harsh on them, but most teams, they would not be on the roster or they would be those really bottom tier special teams kind of guys, Tim Patrick, uh, Hamilton, you know, th- those two, th- they can be special teams guys, but you don't want them being your starters. And so for me, right off the bat, Jerry Judy, he- he's going to take over. I mean, I-, I went to training camp last year and maybe some of our listeners can, can talk about this as well. Uh, the offense was just terrible. There was such a lack of athleticism beyond Cortland Sutton. I mean, he was making plays and, and if the receivers made a play, it was them making a catch with, uh, you know, with, with the defender right there. The defense dominated. And, and so th- you could just tell that there was just something missing there. Uh, Noah Fant helped a little bit when Philip Lindsay finally returned from his injury. He helped a little bit, but it's still, th- there's a reason that the, uh, even Drew Locke today was talking about, and I think it's supposed to air on NFL Network tonight, interview with James Palmer, where he's talking about teams just said, we're going to double Cortland. And if we do that, we think we can beat the Broncos because they don't, the other guys don't scare them one bit. And so again, that, that's why Jerry Judy, the day he walks in should be with the number one offense. Uh, I want to right. take the reins here. Actually, the point that you just said, it was James Palmer, who's been doing a lot of stuff with the Denver Broncos, obviously covering them for years. But uh, he said in an interview that when I cover these games, I talk to offensive and defensive coordinators and players on both teams going into each game every week. And down the stretch for the Denver Broncos, defensive players were just telling me that if we just take Cortland Sutton out of the game, we are beating the Denver Broncos. That was the game plan for every team he talked to. And so now the Broncos add Jerry Judy. They also had a guy named KJ Hamler in the second round. Can't really do that so much anymore. So Sutton is going to be so much better. The, the wide receivers are going to be so much better. And also last year, I thought this was a really interesting stat. You know, going back, watching the tape, Corlin Sutton did a great job of separating from year one to year two in terms of his route running. And yet last year, he still was the 142nd out of 143 wide receivers who ran at least 100 routes uh, in terms of average yards of separation per target, which means that, so Sutton was getting separation. So what does this mean? It means that the Broncos were throwing the ball to Sutton pretty much covered, not covered, didn't matter. They're getting the ball to Sutton because the other guys, even if you're throwing the ball to, let's say, Deshaun Hamilton, it's three yards and down he goes. So, you know, you know, when you look at that stat on its surface, 142nd out of 143 in terms of average separation when targeted, that's not good. But that just shows also that the Broncos were throwing the ball to Sutton and even when he was covered, he was getting targeted. So now that he's going to be less covered, going to have better opportunities, he should be even more efficient next year. So obviously right. getting off the tracks here in regards to the draft class and how they're fitting in here. But right. really excited about uh, this impact and your comment here in regards to uh, Jerry Judy added, adding to Cortland Sutton's ability. Right. I, uh, we, we kept saying before the draft, uh, yeah, Terry Randall, thank you for the super chat. Hashtag Nick Spear Fund. Uh, I saw a couple of people say uh, I heard an opening of a cold snack. <laughs> I always put so. my mic down, so you're not supposed to exactly see it. So I put yeah. the, the mic right by it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, it's here we go. Get this in here as well before we get to it, too bitch, much into the conversation. Bronx legend. Appreciate it. Good stuff, guys. Keep repping. Hashtag state of, of being. Hashtag DB for life. Uh, agreed. But uh, you, you're right. I, Cortland Sutton should be the happiest player on the team other than Drew Locke for what the Broncos have done this offseason. It just makes his job so much easier where he's not having to try to fight through double teams. He's not having a safety shadow him every single time. Uh, it's opening up his underneath routes that he is so good when he gets the ball in his hands of what he can do with it to, to score touchdowns or, or pick up big gains, whatever. Uh, it, it just opens up everything for him, for Noah Fant as well. It makes life easier on everybody in the offense when there's Even more the offensive line. Yeah, it does. Because, I mean, here, here again, um, uh, this is something that Drew Locke talked about. Teams can no longer just do a single high safety against the Broncos and have that safety shadow uh, Cortland Sutton. Whatever side of the Cortland – Whatever side of the field Cortland Sutton is on, that's where that single high safety is going. And that right. opens up the run game because it opens up the box. So right. synergy, so, folks. Synergy, synergy, it, synergy. It is. And so, yeah, when they have to keep that extra safety back, so you're going to see a lot more, uh, you know, two safety looks, teams pe- playing a little bit more of a shell. You're going to see a lot more zone coverage against this team because of the speed. Uh, it, it just, the, the, there's so much, again, that just even, just adding Jerry Judy alone opens up things for this offense. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about another guy here in just a second that, that opens it up even more. 
but uh, teams have to fear what Jerry Judy can do at every level of the field. I mean, that, that's why he is probably going to be the, the, the biggest impact wide receiver right off the bat coming out. One, he's most NFL ready, especially when with everything that's going on with the shortened off season, all those things that are going to happen. He is, he's going to be a guy that can hit the, the field and be a number one wide receiver day one. Uh, he, yeah. he can get open in a hurry. He can, play the slot can play the outside. He can do a lot of everything that you need him to do. The only thing I worry about is him learning the playbook. I don't know how, how good he is at learning playbooks. Uh, I I do know from people I've talked to, he is just a guy that loves football and just lives and breathes football. And uh, so I I do think that he's probably going to work pretty hard at the playbook. It was easy to see that he understood advanced things in, in football that a lot of, Wide receivers, you have to teach them when they get to the NFL. He doesn't have to be taught all those things. And nope. so, again, he can hit the ground running. Uh, when Drew Locke and him can get a connection going, it's going to be amazing how much that opens up, like I said, the entire offense. And one thing I love about Jerry Judy is that, obviously, there are only so many different types of routes that make sense. I mean, the quarterback only has so long to get rid of the ball. But he can run a slant four different ways. I mean, how he's able to use his hips, keep his feet uh, square with his base, uh, not get overextended. And then, you know, he'll sell his hips to the outside. And as soon as that defensive back's caught flat-footed, he's taken off on the inside. So I love the nuance he brings, whether that be the slot or the the Z position, because Cortland Sutton, I think, is going to mostly eat up those X reps. But uh, so I guess that's the biggest question now. Who is, is there anybody on this Broncos offensive wide receiver that is, could threaten Judy's role as the other wide receiver one? Probably our, our second round pick is the only guy that maybe could take away some snaps from him. I mean, that, that's, that's the only thing I can see there it, because I think he can bring so many extra elements to the offense. Let's say they really want to get vertical. Well, you're going to put KJ Hamler on the field over Jerry Judy. I mean, I love Jerry Judy, but KJ Hamler, he's a he's a speedster. I mean, he, he's the guy. Both? Well, I, I know, I agree, but there there might be those plays where they decide. Let's say uh, I know another guy we're going to talk about is Mr. Alberto. That they decide to go big with two tight ends and two speed wide, or you know, sweating on one side, Hamler on the other to force teams to have to still keep those two safeties back. Well, then you got your big front. And you got athleticism on the outside. Well, what kind of defense do you play? Do you play nickel? Do you play dime? Do you play your base defense? What what do you do there? Uh, it just causes a lot of matchup nightmares in those kind of situations. That that's the only way I could see them wanting to take Jerry Judy off the field. Yeah, I agree with you. So I guess the biggest thing is for Judy. He I felt he was the most effective in slot during his time at Alabama. Now, granted, that might be just the situation of what they have around him. He does project well as the Z as well. I mean, a guy who, a little bit skinny, but his ability to beat press, you do see it on tape. Now, granted, he's a two-way go and slot compared to on the boundary, but that's something, and he's a little skinnier as well. So that's something that is a little bit of a projection. But I think for ideally, you're going to see him take a majority of his reps at Z long-term, but probably year one, you're going to see about a 50-50 split between the slot and the Z position at wide receiver and uh, I think he will be the number of the Broncos most targeted wide receiver in this offense, even with the issue going on in regards to getting the offense going, everything running because of everything going on in the world. Yeah. Uh, but I think that Judy's set, I mean, we saw last year with Deshaun Hamilton, just because Cortland Sutton was taking up the more of the explosive routes on the boundary, drawing coverage, et cetera. Uh, Deshaun Hamilton was getting targets like crazy. Granted, as soon as he caught them, he was going down. Now you right. got a guy who's a better route runner, a more explosive athlete. <laughs> better after the catch, blah, 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 blah. And you're having those precise routes with uh, Jerry Judy instead of Deshaun Hamilton. It just makes everything more explosive. And even the simple plays of the, you know, a little slant from the slot can turn into a big game. So right. Jerry Judy, wide receiver one or two, doesn't matter to me, probably less yards per target, less uh, a dot, if you will, for you uh, nerd fantasy nerds out there, average depth of target and uh, compared to Cortland Sutton, but both of them really good. And we've talked about it here on here for years now, building a wide receiver like a basketball team, getting guys who win in different ways. Sutton and Judy win in different ways. Moving on now to round two, while well, Carl coughs, yeah, get that out there. You know, be careful. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mind. No, it's okay. Allergies. Um, uh, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, no, now we're moving on to round two here. Pick 46, KJ Hamler. Now, this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. Jerry Judy, as plug and play as they come for any rookie wide receiver. And again, talking about the 
irregular off season. It's going to be a little harder for rookies, even the typical, typically rookie wide receivers take a little bit to get going probably even more. So this off season, KJ Hamler comes in now he's a guy that I've seen some project more as the boundary of Judy and slot. Although KJ Hamler, I worry about his size to get off press. I mean, that's even more of a projection than Jerry Judy at Z. So probably for me, uh, Hamler comes in as a guy that's going to compete with slot. I think he'll probably get equal points or equal uh, chances between Hamler and Hamilton, the the two Penn State guys, as far as, you know, Hamilton can play some Z when Judy's in slot and Judy can play some Z when Ham- Hamler's in slot. But Hamler's just so explosive. I mean, Vic Fangio, I've, it absolutely warms my heart that old coach Vic is on the table pounding about getting speed for this offense because it can change how defenses play you. I mean, if anybody should know what's going to impact you as a defensive team and what you can do structurally, it's Vic Fangio. So make me feel really validated that we've been screaming that from <laughs> anybody who will listen for the past year. Yep. Uh, but uh, Hamler, probably obviously more of a year two, three, four guy than what you'll get from Judy. But because of his ability to stretch the football field, be a gadget guy year one, and I mean, slot fades on slot fades, inject that straight into my veins. I think that he'll be competing more with Deshaun Hamilton, who I do think will make the team in regards to snaps this season. But hopefully yeah. by the end of the year, he will solidify himself as the wide receiver three. Well, and here's the other thing with him. I, and I had somebody argue this with me, and I'm like, why, why would you argue this part? Because he could also be our special teams returner. Uh, you know, I, I saw um, – what was it? I guess it would have been his sophomore year or redshirt freshman year, whatever you want to call it. I mean, he was one of the best returners in football, in college football, mm-hmm. with that speed and just his vision in the open field. Uh, the Broncos would be stupid not to take advantage of that. I know they have Deontay Spencer, who was a good returner last year. But th- this could also help you free up another roster spot. So uh, I think Hamler could threaten Deontay Spencer's role with the team. Uh, I'm not saying that you want Hamler to be your full-time returner, so I still think Spencer makes it at least this year. But at the same time, I, I just think you have to kind of factor that in, that that could be where they tried to get to get him on the field, uh, get him some more snaps, get him some some actual balls in his hands. Uh, because, I mean, it just – I know that was, yeah, not the best party. But uh, – <laughs> uh, I didn't that, say it. I know, I know I did. But, uh, yeah, it, it just – I think that's going to be one of the biggest things that I'm interested to see this year is the targets that everybody gets. Last year, it, it pretty much was you try to get the ball to Cortland Sutton or Noah Fant, and that, that's about that's about your offense. Every once in a while, you look at everybody else just to keep a defense honest, but for the most part, that was how it went. Now, all of a sudden, the Broncos have – Omni, almost too many weapons, which is kind of a can can you say that? It's like can you have too many pass rushers? Yeah. That's that we we talked about this last week. There's a difference between a good problem and a bad problem. Yeah. And you're talking about a good problem there. Yeah. It, it is. It is a good problem, but it is going to be interesting just to see how the, the disbursement goes. Uh now that's nice where Jerry Judy's coming from an offense that had that problem too. And and yeah. he still got a lot of targets because he is that that target eater. That, that you like on a, an offense where Corlin Sutton, I mean, he still got a lot of targets this last year, but it, it was a lot more further down the field trying to make the big play kind of thing where Jerry Judy is that consistent underneath guy that you can, can really pad the, uh, the completion percentage stats for, yeah. for Drew Locke. And then Hamler, of course, is your other big play player down the field. Noah Fant is kind of your do it all across the field, whatever you kind of need, he can do on the field. Uh, so again, you, you got a lot of options that the Broncos are going to be able to bring. And and I am, I'm interested to see how Drew Locke handles going from one to two weapons to now about five to six weapons. I mean, it's a good problem to have. And one thing I do want to bring up about KJ Hamler, it's something that we preached in regards to adding somebody like Henry Ruggs. You can kind of also say it with KJ Hamler is that because of his speed, because of his big play ability, he can impact a game when he doesn't even have a catch because he's clearing routes down the field. And this is from Chris Trapasso from uh, CBS. He's saying, and a deep over route to Jerry Judy is going to be there now because the safeties have to respect the, in the game plan to stop Hamler. Uh, we never really got to see how fast KJ Hamler was because he didn't run out of the com- combine, didn't have a pro day, but he's a sub four, four guy, maybe a sub four, three guy had 11 catches over 20 yards last year with five touchdowns. So teams have to respect the speed. 
And that's what Vic Fangio wanted. He wanted a guy who had matchup dictating speed to help everybody else have a synergistic effect on the offense. And that's what Hamler can bring, even if he doesn't get targeted. I mean, you have to respect him. It's the Will Fuller effect. So maybe it's a little bit more limited than Ruggs because Ruggs has 20, 25 pounds on him. So Ruggs has a little bit more ability to play the boundary where Hamler might be slot limited. But because of today's game with 11 personnel, and you can get that speed on the field still and not have to worry about it being, you know, smothered by press coverage. So it's right. really a good situation to be in. I'm really excited to see Hamler. I, I do wonder if year one, you brought talked about Deontay Spencer. I think personally I'd like to keep Deontay Spencer on the roster so that way you're not sub- subjecting Hamler to special teams roles. Uh, that way he can mainly focus on his ability as a route runner. And granted, you know, we talk about the home run threat that KJ Hamler is. He's still one of the better underneath receivers too, because he can separate right. and change direction so quickly. I mean, he's a quick hitter as well. So, I right. mean, that, that slant he had against Ohio State two years ago where he just left Sean Wade in the dust. I mean, that was just a quick little boop, and he's gone. So I love this pick. I love both these guys. I think battling for wide receiver three, probably you'll see – I think you'll see Deshaun Hamilton – early on be that wide receiver three, just a little bit more of a trusted guy and can move that offense. But I think they'll lean more and more towards the other Penn state guy and Hamler as the season wears on. This is the overtime podcast network. So uh, here's the play I keep imagining in my head just because it, early in the game, I think this could be that big hitter for the Broncos is Hamler in the slot, Judy on the outside in that Z spot. And you have, uh, Judy run the, the slant pattern to the inside. You have Hamler run the, the wheel route to the outside. And then you've got that one safety that has to choose. Am I coming down to help with the slant route or am I staying deep to help with coverage down the field? And then of course you got, because they're crossing, you got defenders who are, are getting mixed up. And I, I just think that kind of play. And then on, off of that, you can run so many things where you have Hamler fake like he's going to do the wheel route, all of a sudden cut back inside. Judy fake like he's going inside, go outside. And, and again, th- those are the things that I just keep imagining with this pair being on the same side of the field. Because that kind of athleticism, that quickness, the ability to get open in such a hurry, uh, it just the, – the sky's the limit now. I mean, the, the entire playbook is open for this team where it wasn't last year. I mean, they were limited just because of the talent or the lack of talent that was on the roster. And, and so where, where they went from one extreme to the other now, I would say went from probably bottom five playmakers in the NFL to probably, yeah. I would say, at least top ten. I'm not going to say top five yet, but... Too unproven, but exciting. Yeah. Yeah, as far yeah. as the potential, the next five years, they have the potential to be as good as anybody. Right. So uh, we should move on here. We're 22 minutes in and we've been talking <laughs> only about the first two picks. That's yeah. okay. I mean, talk, that's the majority of the talk here. Uh, yeah. Now the Broncos, the third round, they have three third round picks. First guy we're going to talk about here is Iowa cornerback, former Iowa cornerback, Michael Ojemudia, uh, played boundary corner at the University of Iowa, which runs a 4-2-5 defense, mainly playing on the, I guess, the defensive field right. Uh, so like where the left tackle would be, that side of the field, far um, mainly played zone coverage, didn't get beat over the top very often, but Broncos said they liked him a lot, talked about maybe even taking him round two. They liked him enough as far as a fit. Smart guy, long, ran, I think, a four four five forty 40 with the length, with the size, probably one of the last guys in this draft that didn't have – or he has starting upside on the boundary, which is something that has value. Yep. So what is your projection for Michael Ojemudi a year one in this offense? Is he just going to be a special teams guy, or can he work his way into the starting role? And if so, where? Well, I, I think he can work his way into the starting lineup. I mean, cornerback is a position that does not have a whole lot of depth or at least proven depth. It's got a lot of guys with some promise. Uh, yeah. not, some guys that don't have, I mean, Yadam, I mean, they, they might be moving him to safety. So we'll, we'll see on that. But Bosby's coming back from injury, a pretty serious injury. That was pretty scary. I, I don't know what he's going to be. You got Callahan. We don't know what he's going to be, if he's actually going to be healthy or not. We, we've heard mixed reports on his health. And uh, so, and then of course you got Bouye who's coming off kind of an injured season slash bad season. So he has as much opportunity as anybody. I, I do think if there's anybody that's hurt by the short off season, it's him. Just, I, I think he needed that time with the coaching to, to really, work out some of his issues because he is raw. I mean, he came into to college as a linebacker, right? Yes. And then yeah. they moved him to, to, to border cornerback. And so it's just a position that he's still learning. 
And uh, I love the guy. I, I He's one of my favorite picks because I do think he has some of the best upside of any of the picks they made. And, and especially, again, a guy that I can see a huge path to starting. And then he's coming from a system where they played a lot of zone coverage. Hey, he's coming to Denver where they play a lot of zone coverage. So I think he has a, a really good opportunity to, to be a player. One thing I love is he's not a guy, that, at least this last year, that made a lot of big mistakes. No. I mean, he gave up the underneath stuff. He was willing to, to surrender that. But, uh, but you're never going to beat him over the top. And so that, that's something that really stuck out to me that I know Fangio, that, that's something he preaches we're, we're going to make them march down the field. They're not going to hit those big plays over the top. And, and the Broncos, in the, their bad games last year on defense, they got beat over the top. They had players that made miscommunications that, I mean, pretty much both Chiefs games <laughs> were, were both really bad communications in the secondary. And so, again, I, I do see that he could actually be a starter this year. I agree with you there. I do think that your points about him fitting the defense, keeping everything in front of him, Makes sense. It's something that the Broncos defense has really focused on since Vic Fangio has been to town. It's something that on the other side of the ball, you can see it with the Broncos. I mean, when they have no explosive weapons on offense and you have to meticulously move the ball down the field, 10, 12, dri- 10, 10, 12 play drives, and the, it's become so much harder to score in the red zone then because of the compressed uh, defense. So that's, I mean, last year the Broncos had an incredible red zone defense. So if they can keep the plays in front of them, even if they're giving up, you know, long plays and field goals, if you're keeping them out of the end zone, you're doing a good job. You're probably winning the game. So that's something like with Mudia. I do think it's interesting that they've talked about him playing maybe more of a nickel slash safety role. Um, he came to Iowa linebacker and safety. They're kind of figuring out where that body type is. Mm-hmm. Obviously you're not bringing in four and five star athletes. So you kind of have to bring in the athlete and develop them <laughs> at Iowa. Um, but do you think he, that's his position? Do you think he'll play that third safety role? I mean, I've, I've heard some talk about him maybe playing that Will Parks role. Personally, for me, I see him more as battling Bosby as that other boundary corner with Callahan yep. moving to the slot in nickel, nickel. substitution packages. Yep. But th- so you agree with me there? Is that? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think it is between him and Bosby. I mean, I, I guess the other Harris, Devonta Harris, could be in that conversation because he got some starting opportunities last year, uh, and and I do think. To start off the season, they're probably going to lean a lot more on veterans than they have in the past, even though this is a great rookie class. And I do think Hamler and Judy will get some opportunities. And I think one of the other guys we're going to talk about here next, Cushenberry, I think he has as good of opportunity to start as any of the rookies. But for the most part, I still think they're going to lean a lot more towards veterans early on and kind of try to ease in a lot of these rookies as much as they can. Yeah, so OG Moody will be an interesting to watch. Is he going to play that boundary versus Callahan, or is he going to play more of a hybrid role and fill in for Will Parks as that kind of third safety? So worth watching. Also, Isaac Yadam did not have the best year last year, but we will uh, we'll watch for him as well in that regard. I mean, he makes sense. He also had Devontae Harris, who was up and down last year. He really struggled down the stretch and ended up getting benched. Uh, Duke Dawson is still on the team. Uh, they brought in undrafted free agent uh, Sang Bassi. They have... Shaquille Taylor, Elijah Holder. So there's some names there. It just doesn't feel like there's a lot of strong options at cornerback. So we'll see. OG would be an interesting player to see where he fits. One that fits pretty easily, in my opinion. You already touched on it. Lloyd Cushenberry, I think he'll probably be plug and play at center. They're not the best pass protector all the time, but he's long. He's a smart guy. And the only tape that I really saw him get beat up on was against Derek Brown. That's going to happen. I mean, Derek Brown comes yep. top 10 for a reason. And, you know, he's playing behind, playing between Dalton Reisner and Graham or Graham Glasgow. So, yep. you know, Cushenberry, plug and play starter. Maybe Patrick Morris because he's been there. And again, with the offseason being weird this year due to points at the world, um, that maybe you'll see Patrick Morris have a little bit more of a chance than one would expect on paper in a normal offseason. But I think in the end, you take Cushenberry, a center third round you're probably going to plug and play in this is the overtime podcast network yeah uh, he, he should like i said uh it's judy and then probably lloyd cushionberry is the next guy that has the highest chance of being a starter mm-hmm. i mean he, he's in competition with patrick morris morris is a guy that i know that they're they're high on but yet <laughs> he's limited cushionberry his size alone makes it hard for people to get around him uh, he, he, like you said, he's smart. He was a leader there. He got the, the number 18 Jersey. I know a lot of people get confused because he actually wore, wore number 79, uh, college football does not let offensive linemen wear the Jersey number 18, 
Uh, he's obviously not going to wear jersey number 18 in Denver. <laughs> that would be kind of funny to see on the offensive line. Uh, but uh, he is. He's smart. He's a hard worker. I think he and Drew Locke are probably going to get a pretty strong bond going. Um, but he does have his struggles. He doesn't stay very balanced. Um, that, that was something, especially, like you said, against Auburn. Now, how much do you weigh that? Because, again, like you said, he's going against a top 10 pick player that just dominated everybody. But that's, again, that's NFL-level competition. So it right. makes you that's cons- what he's going to face. Yeah. I mean, he's got Chris Jones. I mean, Chris Jones can do even more things as a pass rusher than what – uh, what Brown can do. And I love Brown, but Chris Jones is better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least right now. And, and so uh, he's going to have to improve for sure in some of those areas. And, and I mean, he's coming to the best situation possible with Munchak. And I mean, and like you said, he's got Reisner on one side, Glasgow on the other. So he's got two veterans that know what they're doing, that have strong, shown strong ability and, and both have actually played center. So they understand how the center works and what they need to do to communicate uh, so I, I do expect that 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 interior as the as the season goes on will be very strong for the Broncos. Uh, there might be some communication errors early on, but I think that's one thing that really stuck out to me when watching LSU was how often the offensive line was on the same page. Th- they understood when blitzes were coming, where the blitzes were coming, and that was Cushenberry. I mean, he he understood what was in front of him, and so. I mean, if the offensive line got beat, it was because a guy just got beat. It wasn't because there was a mental mistake. And and that's something last year the Broncos had left and right was mental mistakes on the offensive line compounded with guys that were just not great talents either. So, and shout out to Joe Burrow's pocket awareness as well, helping those guys. They did end up winning yeah. the best offensive line award, but, you know, offensive line quarterback again, synergy. Word of the day, everybody yeah. drink. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Christian Berry, I think plug and play center. Maybe yeah. Patrick Morris is still a dark horse there. But I really am excited about Cushenberry. Uh, yeah. And also, you, I think you want to work on that chemistry right now between Cushenberry and Drew Locke. I yeah. mean, it both sounds- hard workers, smart guys. You want them, same right. wavelength, same brain length, pointing out the bullets. I mean, that's you want right. those guys and- working together for the next decade. Right. And it does sound like Drew Locke is planning on as quickly as possible, safely, to be able to get together with these young guys and try to get some chemistry going. So uh, kudos to him for trying to get that going as much as he can when teams can't really meet. We'll see what, what all happens with that. Um, real quick, before we get to our next one, uh, since we're ha- we're halfway through our time here t- with everyone. Ready? Uh, so I ordered three Building the Broncos hats recently, and I, I thought that I would uh, offer one of those up here to, to one of our listeners today. Now, you're going to have to uh, – hopefully you're on Twitter. Otherwise, we're going to have to figure out a way to find each other and – communicate how for me to send that to you. Um, now you can go get your own huddle up or building the Broncos swag uh, here at this website, huddleuppod.com. Everybody head on over there. But uh, so I was trying to think of a question to, to ask here. Um, hmm. Who should, <laughs> what should I ask here? All right. Well, first I, off, I, you have to follow Carl Dummler on Twitter and also yep. at BTB football pod. Uh, make and sure Nick Kindle MHH. Uh, you don't have to follow me. This is Carl's thing. I, I feel <laughs> feel guilty, but make sure you follow Carl on Twitter. Also follow at BTB Football Pod. If you're following both of those, then you can qualify for that. And then Carl, I guess the question should be: Who is your vote for the most underrated Bronco coming into this season? Just just at you on Twitter, let you know, and you can pick one. Think of one in your head. Whoever answers that, the same as you, then you can pick from them. Okay. So if a bunch of people like say that. Drew Locke is underrated, they'll DM you. I'll, obviously, you have to follow Carl and at BTB Football Pod to qualify, but at Carl on Twitter and say who's the most underrated Broncos at this point in time. Is it Drew so, Locke? Is, are we underrating him? Is it Philip Lindsay? I mean, the backup running back being Philip Lindsay, there's a lot of good options. So the interesting thing is I had somebody ask me this on Facebook Messenger not too long ago, a Bronco fan, and uh, so I already have my answer. Well, So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yep. Uh, Stu McPeak coming in here with a super chat. Really appreciate it. Like I said, every time I see that, it just uh, brings me back to my Seattle days. Love it. It's one of my favorite places. So like like Nick said, on Twitter, uh, if you guys can guess my most underrated player heading into this season, and uh, yeah, get into my head, as, as Buana B says here, that's a scary place to go. But uh, good luck to all of you 
and uh, we, we will see who ends up winning. First person to guess my most underrated player heading into the season. And uh, I'll bring it up at the end again. So make sure you are following at BTB Football Pod and at Carl Dummer MHH. At him, DM him. His DMs are open, ladies. Don't tell his wife. But um, anyway, <laughs> moving on here. Uh, Nick Telvin Ajin, the Broncos' last third round pick, uh, University of Arkansas, former five star player, a uh, guy that's, you know, okay. I mean, he's playing at Arkansas in the SEC. He's not going to have many games where he can pin his ears back and rush the passer unless he's playing whatever children of the corn state that those sec teams tend to play that one game in November, but um, overall solid player. He did be- his best work came into at Arkansas, more of a, uh, a heavy defensive end, put on some weight, put on even more weight preparing for the draft as he was transitioning from uh, the edge position to the defensive tackle position where he's going to play the NFL, a multiple glo- a multiple guy and P- pro football focuses most underrated player heading into the draft this year for the interior defensive line. So I'm excited about him. I do think, obviously, round three pick. He's going to make the roster barring an injury. Uh, Carl, take care of those allergies next time, buddy. I know. Sorry. I forgot forgot my medicine today. I I got so busy outside. I know, man. (laughs) Um, But, uh, yes, Ajim, uh, I think he is going to make this team. I'm curious to see how his usage will be. I think he'll probably be the the second guy off the bench because Draymond Jones is coming into year two. Draymond Jones flashed really well towards the end of last season. I'm really excited about Draymond Jones this year. Um, hopefully, I'm not. Ho- hopefully, that's not your underrated player because now I'm waxing poetic about him. But um, uh, Draymond Jones, probably the other guy, but will be interesting to see where Ajim, you know, is, does he add weight? Is he need more of a sub package guy? Can he play that three, four defensive end? Does he have the length, the power to play? So he's going to be more of a sub package guy. So I like Ajim. That'll be an interesting player this year. Probably the, again, the fifth defensive lineman, but I wouldn't be surprised if he challenges for the fourth most snaps of the interior defensive line, just because, you know, you're going to see some rotation. Maybe Draymond Jones just takes Shelby Harris's spot this year. That's possible. Yeah. Maybe you know, they're trying to limit Harris and Kelsey and maybe, they're playing more four two five three three five, and you see less Mike Purcell for those guys who can pin their ears back. So I've been ranting now. What do you think of his? <laughs> I, I like him. I, I think he is more of a twenty twenty one pick than a twenty twenty pick. He's he's got a lot to learn. He's pretty raw. He's one of those players that I mean, he went into college five star recruit, one of the top recruits in the entire country, and I mean, goes to Arkansas of all places, which is kind of surprising, but that is his home. So understandable, yeah. you want to stay close to home. Um, and they, they were never in a situation to fully take advantage of his skill set. And, and the fact that they were losing most games really badly and his best skill set is getting after the quarterback. Yeah. That first step quickness, that, that quick power to get through the line, make a play. I mean, he had one of those plays that was kind of uh, – uh, why am I spacing on his name? The, the number one overall pick that Houston – not Houston. Um, I guess, yeah, Houston took him. Or they Jayden had him last Brown? year. No, yeah, Clowney, yeah. Um, I don't know why I was spacing on that, sorry. But uh, Clowney, you know, he had that one play where he just rocketed a guy in the backfield. And Michigan Ajim, in the outback bowl. Yep. Ajim had a play just like that. It's usually the first highlight that you see on his highlight tapes of him just busting through the line, boom, hits a guy, guy gets, you know, horizontal going in the air, and uh, it, it's pretty impressive. So, he has some talent and, and I, I think he'll get some snaps just to get him some experience and, and get some work with him. But I do think he needs a year of just developing his body, uh, getting some technique down, working with Bill Kolar and, and the Broncos thankfully have enough depth this year where they can do that. Last year, Draymond Jones kind of got pushed into the starting role just because of injuries to Wolf and, and a couple other guys going down with some, some injuries and so, I mean, that, that's something to kind of keep in mind there. Um, but, yeah, I think he'll have an opportunity just to kind of get some situational snaps this year and work his way to being hopefully a starter next year. Uh, I did want to get to a couple uh, super chats before they, they disappear on me here. Uh, Alvin coming in with the super chat. Really appreciate it. Uh, who is the best drafted player and why? Well, um, it's probably on the Broncos right now, probably Von Miller. Um, but it, in this draft class, honestly, my favorite is KJ Hamler. Now, is he going to be the best? No, I just really like what he brings to the table. And I thought it was really unique that the Broncos doubled down there and made what was a weakness of strength. I know that a lot of people will go against that in regards to, you know, screaming tackle or linebacker or cornerback, but, uh, getting Judy and then getting Hamler on top of it to go with Sutton and Fant, you're talking about guys who all win in different ways. That makes me really excited. And we'll yeah. get, well, how about you? 
Charlie Beagle, Moody, if he's healthy. <laughs> Okay. I mean, uh, I mean it's going to be interesting just because he plays a position that the Broncos just spent big at at the right guard spot. Yeah. yeah. And and so where where do you see it's hard to see his projection to becoming a starter unless they just say we're going to have Glasgow for uh or Glasgow for for 2 years while Moody gets healthy and is a backup and builds up to to being ready and then either we trade off Glasgow or we let him go because his contract will be cuttable at that point. Um, and then we bring in Moody to have two more years of rookie contract, that kind of thing. I mean, th- that could be a possibility. Um, but uh, I-, I really like his game. I mean, it all comes down to health for him. We got to talk he, about him still. We, we do. Uh, but I wanted to get to uh, Nad Ludlow coming in here with the Super Chat. Great job, guys. Best part of the day. It's the best part of our day, too. Uh, so appreciate that one. And uh, uh, yeah. let's see. And we saw somebody here, Calvin had a question. I thought, Calvin Hamilton, if you do have that question, please get it in. Um, So that way we can get to it. And now we're after day one and day two. So guys, get some super chats in. We're going to start here. Uh, We're going to talk one more player here, and then we'll get back to the super chats because we're already running out of time because gosh darn time flies. But Albert Okuebinam. And if I projected his, said his name wrong, I am sorry, guys. Somebody pronounced the – I thought I'm doing a good job, but I'm probably not. Okuebinam. Okuebinam. For me – Okuwebenam is a developmental tight end. I think some people are excited about the size and the tools, and he played with Locke. But for me, he's probably a guy who's a probably more of a niche player. Year one, he's going to come in. He's going to run some seam busting routes as far as the from the tight end position, and also come in and play some some big packages in the in the red zone. Maybe even some H back as well. But for me, you're probably not going to see him. No offense, I think is going to get the lion's share of the snaps. I think number two will be Vinette, just because I do think they want to run the ball. They have the personnel to run the ball still. And then you kind of see Beck and Okoye Benam, uh fight for some packets, fight for some touches there. So Okoye Benam, you're taking a lottery ticket there. It's day three. I understand it's round four, but it's still day three. Massive guy with upside. If he only ends up becoming an okay player, you know that's not what you want. But he's got massive upside. So much more f- to me of a long term projection projection player, a project who needs to get better in his route running, get much better as a blocker. I mean, I know he's six six two sixty or something, but he's not a good inline blocker right now. So probably more of a niche player year one. Hopefully contribute some to special teams and at worst year one coming in for a few snaps a game, run a fall, run a run up the seam. Be big, be fast, stress the safety, stress the linebackers, and he can come in and do that year one. Yeah. Uh, all right. Here, here's uh, – uh, oh, that was not – here we go. Um, what are your thoughts with signing Damian Snacks Harrison to be a rotation nose tackle being 350 pounds for depth to keep beef on the D-line? I, I guess I'm not a fan of the signing. I mean, it depends on the money, obviously, but it, it's – it's short term where right now I'm looking for more long term signings yeah. of guys that I think could maybe show some promise, come on to the roster, do something. I like Damian Harrison, uh, but he's on the downhill part of his career. He wasn't all that great with Detroit last year, given they didn't have a whole lot of talent on that team either. But still, I, I just think Mike Purcell did enough. And with how much the team plays nickel. I think Purcell can handle those nose tackle snaps. And and so I just I have a hard time seeing how he's going to fit the roster because he is so limited as a player. He's a run stuffer. That's what he is at his point at this point in his career. Yeah. And it just like I said, it's just hard to see that becoming a, a long term answer or even this year. Um, and, and yeah, Karen, thank you uh, for coming in here. Uh, sorry, guys, that we can't get to every question. We are we try. limited. That's the yeah. biggest issue. That is, the, we want to yeah. get to every question, but Carl and I just we love the sound of our own voices. I mean, I, I talk to myself all day long, and Carl is a preacher, so he's used to talking a lot as well. So obviously, I know Zach and Chad have the you know trademark on football priests, but we got the actual football priest over here. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, but we try to get as much as we can. That. I, can't I know we didn't do that. That's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll take a and yeah, we we do like I said, like Manny says here, keep asking the questions. Uh, we're, we're not ignoring you. I promise. We're, we're trying to get as much as we can. The, the chat just keeps going fast. And, also, the uh, super chats are colored. And if you're like me, you know, anything that's shiny, it'll like get my attention immediately. <laughs> Ooh, so shiny. like the color comes on the screen. It's like, oh, pretty. Um, but OK, well, we're going to have to be as long winded on these last ones. Quick yeah. thoughts. Two sentences. Albert Okwebenam. 
Yeah, he, he's the one that I have a tough time seeing what his role is with the team. Just because, again, who are you taking off the field to put him on the field? And and that that's my biggest concern with him. I, I do see a red zone opportunity with him because he was very good in the red zone with Drew Locke. Mm-hmm. That, that's, but right now, I'd say rookie year, that's probably his role. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, here, here's another player, uh, Covington, signed to the defensive line. So I, I do uh, – and, yes, uh, James Campbell coming in here. I, like I said, the defensive line group is pretty deep. So that, that's kind of an issue there that I would say. But, uh, yeah, James Campbell, go to Twitter, guys. We, we answer almost everything that is tweeted at us. <laughs> so if you ask us a question on Twitter, I, I promise we're, we're probably going to get to it um, And because uh, we love interacting with you guys even beyond this show as much as we possibly can because we, we just love talking football with anybody that's willing to talk football with us. And if it's not you guys, then it's the wife. So do my wife a favor. Ask me football questions. That way I don't have to talk to her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Alvin coming in. Appreciate it. Uh, you, you've been so great. Uh, stay safe. Thank you. Hashtag blessed. Hashtag prayers. Uh, same to you, Alvin. Same to you. And everybody else listening here, just uh, just uh, stay safe out there. Be smart. And uh, we'll get through this together. We'll keep doing these shows and having a good time. So Albert Okoebanam is done. We We'll have some more questions coming in there. Uh, we Now we got the rounds uh, five and six picks. Uh, Justin Strenad, uh, for me, linebacker from Wake Forest, didn't test the best, had an injury this past year on his bicep. It was either his bicep or his forearm. Uh, needed surgery. A guy who plays much faster than he tested. A smart guy, good coverage guy. I don't know what the long-term upside is as far as Strenad. I like him. I just don't know if he's a a real difference maker at linebacker, but honestly you don't need to have true difference makers at linebacker. You know, you can just get by with solid guys. I think you're seeing that more and more. I mean, the, who was the chiefs last year got by with glorified safeties at their linebacker position. And guess what? They won the gosh run Super Bowl. So, you know, linebacker, if Chernod can come in and play a sub package linebacker, maybe take Johnson or Davis off the field to get a little bit more coverage chops. I think that's a good bet for him. Worst case though, I mean, especially year one, you're going to get a smart guy who can come in and play special teams. But now we're talking about, you know, late day three of the draft. These are lottery tickets. Right. No, you're, you're right. I, I like this pick a lot. Uh, he has some great tape. I mean, it, like I said, if you pay attention to the athletic numbers, you're going to be very disappointed in who this player is. If you pay attention to the tape, you're going to go, wow, this guy's pretty, pretty phenomenal. <laughs> uh, especially in coverage, he proved to be one of the best in especially the ACC. And uh, you just have to understand sometimes with linebacker, it is more about instincts than it is about athleticism. Now, athleticism helps. And when you can have both together, that's when you get an all pro player. But it's hard to find that that combination. Uh, it's why linebacker is one of those. It's kind of a guessing game. I'm trying to figure out what's going to work, who's going to actually come in and be a part of your system. Uh, but uh, Terry Randall coming in here with another super chat. Hashtag state of being. Hashtag Broncos. I uh, appreciate that very much there. And uh, and then I, I saw something else that I wanted to, to get to here. Uh, Jeff Green, I will remedy that after the show today. Sorry about that. I meant to be following you. I, I, I love talking to you about football and anybody else here. Again, just follow us on Twitter and we can talk football all day long. And well, uh, talking football, got to move it along here. Chad actually yep. said we got to not run long today. So that's too bad. I would talk another two hours with you guys if I could. Uh, Broncos early sixth round pick, uh, Natain Moody, uh, guard from Fresno State. Am I mis- misremembering that? It's Fresno State, right? Yep. Yes, Fresno State played some left tackle, played guard, has sub 32 inch arms. I know some people talk, well, he played some left tackle at the Fresno State. Why can't he play tackle at the NFL level? He's, they don't even want guys with sub 34 inch arms playing tackle, but now we're yep. talking about a guy with sub 32 inch arms. He's, he's a guard. I think, you know, the power is incredible. He's missed, he's torn two Achilles and his, or two, two excuse me, two ACLs and also a Liz Frank injury. So, in my opinion, massive upside. Obviously, massive upside. Power guy. Reminds me a little bit of Mikey Potty, uh, who is one of the best power guards in football for a long time. Yeah. I think probably your best bet with Natane Moody is that you put him on the IR this season, give him a redshirt year, and um, you know, hopefully he becomes something, potentially becomes Jake Butt, but you're talking about a six-round pick. That's the role of the dice you get at this point in the draft. Right. I mean, th- th- that's why he's there. That's why he's not being taken in the second yep. round. Exactly. That's the only reason. And so I, I would I would rather take a guy with injury history 
and higher upside, then a guy that has zero upside is just going to be a special teams player for you, but doesn't have the injury history. Like a guy that I I love him to death, but like a guy that the guys that you don't want to have propagated on your roster is while he's a great, you know, person and good character player, you don't want to be filling your day three with only Josie Jules. Yeah. You know, like if you have, if your whole roster in the day three is a bunch of Josie Jules, you have guys that are making the roster, but are they moving the needle? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd rather take a shot, especially here around six. If you can get a guy, I'd rather him be off the roster in a couple years than, you know, be taking up time and not not a dude. So right. that's my opinion. Right. And, and so, yeah, I, I loved – I mean, I think everybody here knows I love the Moody pick. Yeah. I, I think he could end up being maybe – I mean, if he's healthy, I think he could be the best rookie, other not named Jerry Judy, on this team. Yeah. Just because he has the, the highest upside to, to really be that kind of impact player. And so uh, <laughs> I like this question. Who runs the fastest 40 time at MHH? It's not Eric. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought about doing a body issue. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> Can I, and, give me some time. Let's, let's do the next. Yeah, I know. I I know. Need, quarantine has not been kind. I lost all that weight before <laughs> the wedding. And now I've been cooking. I've been not drinking. Okay. Unless, you know, hashtag Dick beer fun. But, um, uh, yeah, you know, two more guys here. Quick, we'll get to them quickly, and then we're going to take your questions because we can't be here long because yeah. boss man said we can't. Tyree Cleveland, seventh round pick, a guy that brings a lot of energy. I've read a lot of good as far as his his character. I mean, he's a guy who you see him run down the sideline cheering his teammates on on a big play like all the time. People love that. I think he's going to be battling with Tim Patrick and Jawan Winfrey as far as that fifth slash sixth wide receiver spot. Much more of a special teams player, a gunner. Uh, odds are I think he ends up on the practice squad probably along with Jawan Winfrey this season. You'll see them both on the practice squad, in my opinion. But there is a small chance that Tyree Cleveland could come for Tim Patrick's job. He's younger. You have more years of control with him. And, right. you know, just it just pushes the contracts and those needs down the line. You know, Tim Patrick, I believe, is he was a restricted free agent this past year. I think so. Other res- exclusive rights are restricted. So you're just yeah. kicking that can down the line as far as one of those roster spots. It's one of those, if you think you can get him on the practice squad – then you keep Tim Patrick. If you think another team is going to want that kind of speed on their roster, then you probably keep Cleveland. Uh, something else to kind of keep in mind that's kind of just a neat fact. Uh, his jersey number is going to be 86, and his last name is Cleveland. 86 is when they had the drive hmm. in, against Cleveland. So I, I don't know if they did that on purpose, but uh, yeah. So <laughs> Darian P coming in here in Super Chat. Eric has insane play speed, though. Hashtag Nick's Beer Fun. <laughs> Eric would agree with you. Uh, not sure we would agree with you, uh, but uh, hey, when he, needs, it, when he needs to move, he can move. Exactly. And no, that's a good point. Last guy here. Got to keep it rolling. Then we'll get to the questions. So the last time as get the questions in. We'll talk real quick, though. Derek Tuska, uh, edge rusher from Notre Dame, tested pretty well the combine, but a smaller guy, a little bit more of a probably a sub package rusher needs to show a little bit more as far as coverage ability. I believe to make this team, he's going to be probably battling with Malik Reed as far as that fourth or fifth edge rusher kind of off the team. I do think that Justin Hollins is probably safe, a little bit more upside length as far as that ability to make the team. And also they brought back Jeremiah Tachu, but I think uh, Derek Tuska, it's going to be Tuska versus Malik Reed. In my opinion, Tuska does have practice squad eligibility. I think I might like Tuska's upside more than Malik Reed's though. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm with you. All right, some questions here. Bring them um, in, guys. Bill, super chats or not? You know, if Bill, super 1293. Chats, yeah. Uh, would any of you do a Tunsil slash Ramsey type of trade if the right player became available? So I'll, here, here's how I, I will voice this. If the Broncos outperform this year, Drew Locke shows that he is a top 10 quarterback in the NFL, and the, the wide receiver weapons prove that they are everything that we're hoping that they're going to be, and the Broncos feel like they are that one player away. Yes. I mean, the, the Chiefs did it this last year. They went and got Frank Clark, made that trade to, to really help their interior uh, or their, their defensive line to, to be able to get after the quarterback. They made a couple other trades that obviously, I mean, it paid off. They won a Super Bowl. I, I think there are times where you got to take those risks and, and be willing to give away some draft capital. The Broncos are going to have some cap space to be able to do those things. So, uh, yes, I would be willing to make a trade like that if Drew Locke proves to be that that guy. That's the biggest thing. I hate to be that guy, but I need to see more Drew Locke before I make that trade. 
So, I mean, the five-game sample size right now, obviously we saw greatness from him in that Texans game. I thought he was pretty good in that Kansas City game as well, actually. But, I mean, a little bit, they really put the training wheels on, maybe even added an extra set of wheels in regards to that Detroit game, the Vegas game. Chargers game was a little bit up and down. So five games, I believe in Drew Lock. I'm cautiously optimistic. But until I feel better about him, I don't, I couldn't give up a first round pick. You know, just, you need to have that first round pick just in case things go wrong with Drew Lock this year. That's just the sad reality of it. All right. Uh, got another one here. Uh, is uh, from Oscar, is Boye a scheme fit or did Denver just think he was the best they could get? He is a scheme fit. Um, he has that click and close ability to come downhill, make plays. That's exactly what you want out of your cornerbacks. He is a great tackler as well. Uh, and, and Fangio has wanted this guy since his time in Chicago. So he's been keeping his eye on, on Bouye and, and obviously being able to get him here in Denver. That was huge for him. So I, yes, I do think he is a scheme fit. Yeah. No, you're definitely right. And I think I somehow got the school wrong with Derek Tusk. I see a couple people saying, uh, did I say Notre Dame? Excuse me, North Dakota. I saw NB, <laughs> NDSU. I saw yeah. Notre Dame, or wow, there it is again. North Dakota State uh, beat the Iowa Hawkeyes the year after Wentz was drafted at Iowa. It was a major upset. So I'm, maybe I hold that against them. I'll just call them wrong forever. That green and yellow. Yeah. Eh, no, I'm just kidding. North Dakota State, yeah. I respect the program. They got a good quarterback. Right. Have you seen any of him yet? I, I haven't watched any, but I've heard he's pretty good. Trey Lance, so. Uh, Vinay P coming in here. What do you think about Elway's plan in later rounds? I'm fine with the high risk, high reward players like Albert O, Muti, and Sternad uh, instead of getting special teams players at like safety. I think Sternad is kind of that safe player. Yeah, it's the injury thing, but he's he's more of that safe kind of guy. Where if he performs better than Josie Jewell has on his first two years, then you you hit the pick, in my yeah. opinion. So. Yeah, I I think you need a mix because you need those special teams players. You need those guys that can be consistent uh, bottom of the roster guys that are going to contribute if you absolutely need them to. Uh, they so need this. they yep. need that, or I guess that's no wait. I can't even. Yep, talk you had it right. You had okay, right. for you guys, it's backwards on me, but that's what you need. <laughs> need to have All that right. C on the jersey. Uh, Robert Castle coming in here. Which AFC West team killed the draft? Draft other than the Broncos. Oh man, I guess I would say the the Raiders just overall, but just because they had more picks. I mean, they had five picks in the top 100. It was just you know they had more shots in the chamber, yeah. both in the chamber. I, so I, say, I don't think I the did. Chiefs did amazing. I don't think the Chargers did amazing. I think the Broncos came away with the best draft, but just because of the amount of picks that they had in the top 100, I feel like the Raiders did a, a solid job. Well, and here's the thing about the Raiders: they seem to mess up the early rounds and do pretty good in the later rounds. Gosh, Max Crosby. I think that bothers me. He's so yep. good. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, and, and so th- I guess that that's where I see the strength of their draft was in the later rounds. I liked some of their picks, thought they were pretty good value, where in the early rounds, of course, yeah, they were way off on their rankings, at least compared to me. And and so, uh, I, but I'd still give it to them. Like you said, Chargers, I'm not a big fan of their, their new quarterback. I think he's going to be probably average. I, I don't think he has... He has a pretty high floor, I think, but he doesn't have a huge high, high ceiling. Um, and then, of course, taking Murray in the in the first, coming back and trading up to get him. Wasn't a fan of that just because I, I liked a lot of the linebackers. And Murray, you've talked about it where you can fake him out. I mean, you, you could do the whole, like, uh, you know, fake your dog out with the fake the throw. He's going to fall for that every time. Yeah, everybody talks about his energy. And his passion and work ethic and whatnot, I just did not see the processing ability. And again, I think I said it a hundred times on here when we were doing the draft podcast, but if that guy does not make an impact in the pass game, I don't want him in the first round. You can't use a premium resource on that player. And I just did not see that from Kenneth Murray. He was a chasing tackle linebacker who played really simple zone concepts and did not have uh, good processing ability. So I think the Chargers, I think I really like where they were going to that defense. But Justin Herbert and Kenneth Murray and giving up your day two picks, man, I just <laughs> I would I would not have done that, especially with their offensive line issues. I mean, Justin Herbert played behind a really good offensive line and a pass rush depraved uh, pack or Pac twelve. Now he's going to go to the Chargers with that offensive line, man. I don't know. All right, uh, can we get one question in real quick? Oh, Chad can wait a couple minutes. We got a few more. <laughs> he said we had, we had a little bit of window here. If we go an hour and five minutes, I think Chad can live. Okay. Um, so uh, Jinga Ninja coming in here. Can Cortland have Megan 
Megatron numbers in the next few years. He definitely has the best stiff arm in the league. So the, the problem now is actually there, there's almost too many weapons for him to have those kind of numbers. I still think he can have like that 12 to 1400 yard season just because he's that good. But when we're talking like the 1800 yard seasons, I just think there's so many weapons now. He's not going to see as many targets as he could have if, it, say, the Broncos stayed the course and they just kept force feeding it to him. And, and also Megatron, which is really interesting with him in his career. Obviously, when you have gosh darn Megatron, one of the best freak players to ever play the game of any position, you're going to feed him targets like crazy. But once Megatron kind of started to dwindle a little bit in his athletic ability, uh, they brought in, I believe, Jim Bob Cooter. Matt Stafford's ability got much better when they started spreading the ball around. So Sutton could put up Megatron numbers, but I think just also because the offensive game in general is increasing the pass volume. But I think that means bad things in regards to the overall synergistic effect, everyone drink, for, of the offense. Because that means yeah. that Judy's hurt. That means that you know something went wrong if, if Cortland Sutton is putting up those individual numbers. And I will say, I think the – I'd rather have Sutton be much more efficient, you know, calling in more targets, better yards per target, better touchdown rate. Look at those rate numbers rather than the count statistics. I think those are key in regards to the health of the offense. Yeah. Uh, saw somebody ask the question of who won the trade between the Bears and the Raiders for Mac. Everyone loses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say that the, I'd give it to the Bears just because they made the playoffs with Mac. Is it too early to say for the, the Raiders? I mean, we don't even know about some of their picks yet. So, like, if yeah. some of those guys really hit, that's fine. I mean, the biggest thing, the Bears would have won, but they chose Mitchell Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson. And yep. once you did that, the quarterback position is so important, you screwed the pooch. Yep. There it goes. I mean, you had a great defense. You had a quarterback who couldn't throw freaking left. It's yep. over. No, nope, I agree. That That's that's one of the biggest differences there. If you can't get the quarterback right, it doesn't matter what else you have. I mean, even here in Denver – Manning wasn't great, but you still, at least he had his leadership qualities that he brought to the team. You know, he at least had some of that, the teams had to fear what he could bring to the table. There's a reason uh, that quarterbacks like Derek Carr and Andy Dalton get paid huge contracts, Nick Foles. It's not because they're good. It's because if you don't even have a competent quarterback, everybody's fired. Yep. Everybody. I mean, we've seen that in Denver. Everybody's fired. So that's why you see mediocre quarterbacks still get paid. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah. Make sure you head on over to huddleuppod.com. Check out our BTB uh, swag that's out there. Some great hats. Like I said, I've ordered three of them and uh, very excited to, to get those in the mail here very soon. And hopefully one of you will, will be getting one of those very, very soon. Uh, the, the question of the day to, to be able to, to win that hat. First person to guess who my dark horse underrated player on the Broncos roster is for this upcoming season. But, you need to be following at BTB football pod. We will check and you need to be following. Yeah. I got enough followers. You guys are whatever you guys are mid. I'm just kidding. But Carl follow Carl. He's the one giving it away. It's from the bottom of his heart. He's the nice one there. So at follow Carl Dummer MHH as well. Probably time for Carl. Any more questions here? Uh, worried about the, here's an interesting one. Jody has been hit, hitting us with this. I know he's very much an anti bulls guy. Didn't love rugs. Nick, are you worried about KJ Hamler's drops? I am worried about his drops. I mean, that's how could you not? There's a reason that he fell to that round. That being said, I think there's a little bit too much being made about his drops. If you watch his tape, uh, Sean Clifford was a glorified tight end playing quarterback. I mean, he's like Taysom Hill if Taysom Hill was less accurate and and less athletic. So some of those drops, I mean, gosh, you'd see Julio Jones struggle with those drops. And also I think that with uh, Hamler, the biggest thing with him is that he brings speed and he's got the ability to separate. I mean, we've went over the numbers with Will Fuller a hundred times on here. Will Fuller had a 13% drop rate in college and he still is an incredible difference maker, even without touching the ball. So I think right. you're still going to see that with Hamler. However, it is a concern. It's something you want to see improve. That's a nuanced answer. I know you do. Not everybody always gets it on the radio in, in Denver, maybe, but um, we're going to get that to you here. So that's my opinion. Yep. Agreed. So make sure you guys are uh, following Carl Dummer at MHH. Make sure you're following at PDB Football Pod and at Carl. See if you can guess his most underrated player for the Broncos heading into the season. Carl, anything before I read the uh, the outro here? Nope. Uh, great show. Everybody, thanks for, for participating. And uh, sorry we didn't get to as many questions today. We had a lot that we wanted to talk about. We're going to have a lot of weeks where we're going to be able to get to lots of questions. Yep. And so I'm, I'm excited for those as we move forward. But, uh, yeah, 
Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys, and I'll, I'll let you close us out here. Well, again, make sure you're following Carl on Twitter, at Carl Dumbler MHH. Follow me on Twitter as well, at Nick Kendall MHH, and go over to milehighhuddle.com, an affiliate of the Maven Coalition and Sports Illustrated. Uh, go to iTunes, leave us a five-star rating and a comment. I still go check those, and you guys' support can help us continue to bring you these Denver Bronco deep dives, which obviously Carl and I love to do. Uh, you guys can follow the Building the Broncos podcast and all, the, all our other great audio content by subscribing to the Huddle Up podcast wherever you listen to these shows. You can follow us on Twitter at Malahi Huddle and at BTB Football Pod. Uh, Carl, you know, make sure you guys at Carl DM him. Uh, make sure you, you know you text him enough, message him enough that his wife is wondering what the heck's going on. And, you know, <laughs> I like to spam him at two a.m. asking him, "Have you seen this player that's going to be eligible in twenty twenty two? He's incredible." Blah blah blah. So that's uh, that's what we're about. You know, and ask us football questions all the time. I absolutely love yeah. it. If you if you can distract me from doing some work and I can talk football and go down that rabbit hole with you, take me with you. I'm here for you. <laughs> but uh, anything, Carl, before we get on out of here? Nope. I think you covered it all, man. Yeah. Well, hit the like button. Thank you guys so much for coming in here today. We really appreciate it. Uh, the Building the Broncos podcast, uh, TGIT. Thank God it's Tuesday. Best day of the week, in my opinion, since we've been doing these. I love doing it. Really appreciate you, Carl. Appreciate you, listeners. We hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed it. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. As always, got to depart with Go Broncos. You've been listening to Building the Broncos. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.